Hey, welcome back to Racing. Well, we're going to start out the shop segment now. We've got Carl Bush here from Willwood Disc Brakes. Carl, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Roger. It's good to be here. Well, of course, with Carl here, you know we're going to talk about brakes. And Carl, what we typically like to do is, you know, start at the beginning and give the viewer, uh, the racer, everything they need to know from, from start to finish. Uh, one thing I've always felt about brakes is, you know, you can certainly pick up a little bit of time on the track with a well-designed brake system and you can certainly lose a whole bunch of time with an improperly prepared system. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Roger. A lot of people don't understand in order to go fast, you have to be able to properly slow down. Yep. Why don't you lead us through a little bit now, and let's just start out with the pedals. Well, one of the things we're going to talk about, and the word that you mentioned was brake system, is it is a system. It's a group of elements, parts working together. Uh, there are mechanical aspects to the system, with the first one being the pedal, but we can't leave out the driver, because this is where the energy comes from to actuate the brake system. And if the brake system isn't in good balance, that uh, the driver's not confident, if he's not comfortable, then lap times are gonna suffer. And if your concentration is broken just for a tenth or two, that can be a difference between passing a guy and not passing a guy. Yep. So what we'll talk about, the first mechanical element, uh, after we get that pedal effort that Dalton's gonna make and send it downstream, we're gonna talk about pedals. And some of the different terminology you'll hear when people are talking about pedals, you'll hear things like, swing mount pedals, where the pedal mounts high and the pedal mounts down. You might hear such a terminology as a floor mount pedal, which is kind of a swing mount pedal turned upside down. But this is more typical of the pedals that you'll see in uh, asphalt super late models like what Dalton races. But the type of car that you race in, whether it's going to be a hobby stock, a pure stock, or a street stock, up to a full-blown super late model and a lot of different combinations in between, are going to have some determination on what type of pedal you might use in the car. If you take a, what you might see in a, in a hobby stock or a pure stock car, this is more typical of what you see, and this is most often what you'll see in your passenger car. You'll see a swing mount pedal with a single push rod operating a single master cylinder with tandem fluid outlets. That means one pedal, one push, you're going to get an equal amount of pressure out of both outlets. You know, a lot of times you're required by rules that that's what you have to run, the stock type pedal. That's right, and oftentimes that'll limit the amount of adjustments you might be able to make to the overall static bias of the system when you're restricted to using those types of components. Fortunately, in the kind of cars that Dalton races, the super late models, we have a different type of pedal. Normally, these cars are going to use a floor mount pedal. You asphalt guys love to have that weight down nice and low. Oh, yeah. Keep that low center of gravity, keep that car cornering. But we're also going to have a pedal that's mounting and it's going to use two master cylinders. We're going to have one master cylinder that we can use for the front. We can use one master cylinder that we can use to the rear. Dual mount master cylinder. And another unique part of this pedal is it has an element that we call a balance bar. What the balance bar will be able to do is it's going to help to be able to separate the load in between the two master cylinders so that would be one more element that we can use to help set up the overall system in the car. Some other terms that you might in, uh, hear in terms of pedals, we talked about floor mount, we've talked about swing mount. This is a forward mount system where the master cylinders are going to be outside the firewall. But there are also systems made where there's a leverage bar where the master cylinder is a reverse mount pedal where the reverse master cylinders will be up under the dash of the car. But once again, it comes down to the constraints of the type of the car that you're trying to build. Let's talk about the brake bias a little bit. I mean, like in the middle of the race, you might want to, a driver would like to make adjustments on how the car's handling to change the characteristics of the car and uh, get down into that corner and be consistent with your lap time. You bring up a very important point to where we talk about and differentiate between the static bias set up on the car and the dynamic bias set up on the car. The dynamic of what's going on in the car when the car's out there moving. Now, whenever you talk about the static, we're gonna set that up with the different components that we use. Now, when we get back to that static bias, before we get to that point, we wanna talk about one other thing that the pedal actually does. We're gonna take that pedal, and what the pedal really is, is it's a leverage bar, okay? You'll hear terms such as pedal ratio used to describe talking about pedals. The pedals in your car are about a six to one ratio. That means if we take this distance from this pivot point to the middle of the pedal pad and we divide that by the distance from the pivot point to where the balance bar touches and attaches, this is going to give us a ratio. Typically we're looking at about a six to one, maybe a seven to one pedal. That means for every hundred pounds of effort that you make on the pedal pad, we're going to send 600 pounds of force to the master cylinder. 
If this was a seven to one pedal ratio, a longer pedal, every 100 pounds of force that you generate onto the pedal, you're gonna put 700 pounds of load onto the master cylinder. So by being able to use that pedal leverage with different pedal ratios, that's gonna give you options on what the driver is gonna feel in the car based on the other components that he has downstream from there to make sure we have a balanced system on the car. And you could use that pedal ratio to help uh, adjust the driver feel a little bit too. Yeah, now you have to be careful. Drivers always like a real hard, firm pedal, so you have to be careful if you have a real short pedal ratio, it's gonna give you a good, firm feel from the pedal, but that means you're gonna have to exert a lot of effort on the pedal to generate enough of pressure to make that car stop. So those things all have to be in good balance else your legs are going to be tired by the end of the race. Oh yeah. Okay Carl, we talked a little bit about the balance bar, now let's get a little bit more in depth on that. Yeah, we mentioned balance bar when we're using a pedal assembly like this to where we have a dual mount master cylinder where we're going to use one master cylinder for the front and one master cylinder for the back of the car to where we have a balance bar that's going to split that force coming from the pedal in between the two master cylinders. Now notice I said force at this point, we're not talking about pressure just yet. But when I'm out at the racetracks and I'm working in among the teams, I find that the balance bar is probably one of the most misunderstood parts of the brake system. What this balance bar actually does is it splits the force coming from the pedal. This spherical bearing runs inside this housing on the pedal arm itself, and this is where the force goes to against this bar. Now, when this balance bar is set up so that this bearing is exactly halfway in between the two clevis points, both master cylinders are going to get the same amount of force from the pedal, so if they're the same size master cylinders, they're going to both make the same amount of pressure going out. Now, as this balance bar gets adjusted one direction or the other, the closer this bearing gets to one of the clevis pivot points, the more leverage this pivot will get as compared to the other side. The clevis that's closest to the bearing always gets more force. Now, we always want to try to have a static bias set up so that we can start the race out somewhere with the bearing fairly well centered in between the clevis points. That's where the balance bar is going to be most mechanically efficient and it will stay most consistent. Now in addition to having the balance bar in the car set along with the rest of the components, oftentimes we're going to use a remote adjuster cable. This is gonna give the driver the opportunity to make adjustments here with the knob somewhere within close reach so he can make mild adjustments to fine tune the position of that bearing, fine tune the bias as the race goes on. Dalton, do you find this to be a real advantage to you in being able to make those kind of adjustments in the car from the cockpit on the track? Absolutely, I mean, it makes the laps a whole lot more consistent, say like if tire burn off and fuel burn off, it'll get freer or tighter towards the end of the run, you can easily put more front brake in it to or tighten you, it up. Or, or if you miss the chassis set up just a little bit. Uh, yeah, even then. When we talk about making those adjustments on the track, that tells a little bit difference about the static bias set up on the car versus the dynamic bias set up on the car. When the car's sitting level and still in the shop, all the sizes of those components, that's your static balance. But when you're out there on the track, you're going fast, the car's body rolling, you're going into deceleration, you've got gear and engine compression all working on the rear wheels. Now we got dynamic balances going on. Things are in motion. So being able to fine tune and adjust and have that opportunity to adjust the dynamic balance is what's really going to help to keep you slowing down properly so you can keep going faster. And I think you mentioned too to uh, have the bearing centered in there when you start out the race. That's real important too because that way you don't, you're not covering up a problem in either your setup or the brake system itself. True. Whenever you find yourself, if you're racing, and you're finding that you're adjusting that balance bar either the whole way to the front or the whole way to the rear, it's time to start thinking about what else might be going on in your race car. Are you missing something on the chassis setup, or is there maybe something in your brake system static setup to where you're that far out of balance, you need to start thinking about what you might want to fix on a race car that's going to give you the opportunity to start the race out with that balance bar somewhere in a more neutral position. And, and of course, in a neutral position, it's going to give you more room for adjustment as the race goes on too. Yes. And also, if you have it all the way to one side, you might be quicker for the first 15 laps, but those, the front or rear brakes, are going to take on so much more heat that pretty soon it's going to be just the opposite and all you're going to have is say rear brake when you adjust it for front brake. 
Yeah, once again, putting everything in balance so that you have all four wheels working together to stop the car instead of just the front of the car or just the back of the car is going to do a much better job of making sure that you're still on the track when it comes time to the end of the race. You know the old adage, to win you first must finish. Don't abuse that, that uh, balance adjuster either. Okay, Carl, we've talked about four set to pedal now. Let's talk about turning that into pressure. Yes, that's the job of the master cylinder, to take that force or load that we've been talking about that's coming from the pedal and turning in that into hydraulic pressure to send downstream to operate the pistons in the calipers. And this is where we can start setting up the braking system to make it do what we want it to do. Yes, this is one place where a decision comes into play about what size master cylinder do we run. Uh, in the case of a balance bar master cylinder where we're going to have two master cylinders, do we run the same size? Do we split the bore sizes? Uh, in the case of a tandem outlet master cylinder like this, typically these are going to be the same bore diameter the same way through. So you're going to getting the same amount of pressure. But what determines the amount of pressure that a master cylinder makes is that bore diameter. That load coming into the master cylinder through the push rod that amount of that load is divided by the square inches of bore area of the master cylinder. That's what determines how much pressure you make. The short, simple version, smaller bore diameter master cylinder will make more pressure with the same amount of force at the pedal. A larger bore diameter master cylinder will make less pressure with the same amount of force at the master cylinder. But just like an engine with a bore and stroke ratio, if you have a smaller bore diameter, to displace enough of fluid to move those caliper pistons, you're going to pick up a little longer stroke at the pedal. Now, you know, we've got a lot of viewers, of course, that have to run a tandem uh, because of their rules. So now, what option do those guys have to start balancing their system when, when they put their system together? For those type of applications, what, one thing they have a choice of is to use something called the proportioning valve. Now, what these valves will do is these will manipulate the pressure before that pressure gets to the caliper. Now, these are two different types of proportioning valves that do basically the same job. This is a lever type proportioning valve. This is a knob type proportioning valve. This lever type, it'll give you six different presets on how much pressure that it changes. Now with the knob adjust wheel, it gives you the same type of adjustment, but we're gonna make small incremental adjustments by the turn of the wheel as opposed to those preset positions by the position of the lever. A little more finite on that one. A little more finite. Now, one misconception, though, about what proportioning valves really do is a lot of folks think that as you adjust this, you decrease the amount of pressure reduction that occurs in the proportioning valve. And that's not really true. What it does, these valves, once the valve is actuated, it's always going to reduce the pressure by about 50% or so. But what, when you make the adjustments, that determines how much pressure builds up ahead of that valve before that valve kicks in and starts reducing that pressure down proportionately to the pressure that's going to the other line to the other end of the car. So it's kind of like a blow-off valve in a way. Yeah, in a sense, if you had the proportioning valve set fairly tight, you might have the line going to the front uh, and the line going to the rear both come up to maybe 500 pounds. But at that point, one line might continue the climb and then the other line is going to be continued to cut down by 50%. If you adjust that down to a softer setting, maybe they'll only come up to 300 pound, and then that valve kicks in to reduce that pressure. So what you get is a difference in the proportion that's split at those pressures above that setting above point. It. So if you're modulating the pedal very soft on it, it might even, the adjustment may not even show up until you hit that point. Yeah, at those lower pressures, you may never feel the result of the proportioning valve until you go down on the pedal hard enough to spike the pressure up to let the pressure start to to blow off back. Well, that's all the time we got for this week. We'll see you next week on Racing TV.